I invite you, if you have a, a Bible, I invite you to open up this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, you feel free to reach for one there. There should be one in the pew. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to be looking at a few different passages, but that's a place that we will begin seeing some, some words that Paul makes that are pretty clear. <clears throat> was watching a, a, on the television uh, last week or so, I only caught a few clips, of, you know, a little bit of the, the movie City Slickers, but what I was shocked by is realizing that it, it came out 20 years ago, you know, City Slickers, you know, uh, and so it, I, when I go to say it, I'm thinking, Wow, I'm, I'm using this movie thinking everybody remembers it, but, but it was before, it was before my, my daughter Natalie was born, right? But in the movie, uh, Billy Crystal, uh, him and a couple of his city friends, you know, they decide that they got to get out of the city. They need to escape their jobs and their city lives, and so they're going to go out to the west, and they are going to be part of a cattle run. You know, they're going to be a ca- on a cattle drive. They're going to pay for a week to go out there to a real dude ranch, and indeed they do. When they run, they meet there, you know, your, your classic, you know, hardened, you know, cowboy, Curly. And Curly is played by Jack Palance, you know, and he has that voice and these city guys come out here, you know. And he's on a ride with Billy Crystal and it's Curly and Billy Crystal and Curly says to him, you know what the secret of life is? And he says, no, what? This. Billy Crystal says, your finger is, and he says, one thing, just one thing. Billy Crystal says, great. What is that, what is that one thing? And he says, that's what you have to figure out. You know, and if, I'm, if I'm in the scene, I want to say, gee, hey, gee, thanks a lot, Curly, for opening up the vault of wisdom there for us. You know, thanks so much for, for, for sharing nothing, right? Curly doesn't really say anything because according to Curly, that one thing that's the key to life, the secret to life, could be different for every one of us. But we're here today, and I believe the Scriptures make it clear that there is one thing, one thing, one truth that can change every life in the world that's convinced that it's true. There is one truth that can change everything every moment of my life. Every challenge I face, every fear I have, every hope, every perspective, if I'm convinced that it's true. That Jesus Christ really, truly, historically, personally rose again from the dead for me. Let's ask the Lord to convince us today, or at least remind us, how that changes us when we're convinced. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much. Father, I thank you as, a, as someone who has the privilege to stand here in this pulpit. I thank you that there is nothing I have to make up. There's no pressure on me to come up with a good story. Thank you, Lord, that it's just the facts revealed, verifiable, that we proclaim that it really is a good story. It really is a happy ending and every day in between. For those who are convinced 
of the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, have your way in our hearts in these moments, we pray in his name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is <clears throat> honest. He's not trying to come up with any kind of fallback. There is no fallback to the gospel, to the Christian message. If it, if it was wrong, there's, Christianity's empty. It's done. It's meaningless. If you got the letter that I sent out for Easter, you can't have a Christianity without God. There is no man-made Christianity. You can't just kind of kind of just hang on to some of the good things and get rid of the things you don't. If, if the heart of the gospel isn't real, there's nothing. Paul makes it very clear and honest. He doesn't give himself any wiggle room. He doesn't say, well, you know, there's always... No, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17, Paul says this, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. And you always will be. Paul says, without the resurrection, just everybody going home, enjoy the ham, and, the, and the, you know, whatever else you're eating with it, or maybe whatever, maybe you're, what, you don't eat ham, whatever it may be, go on home, because there's no reason to be here. But in verse 20, he says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. See, we started the service with that video because I wanted what was at the center of its theme. The resurrection changes everything. The Apostle Paul says, make no mistake about it. If you have everything else in Christ's life and you don't have the resurrection, go home and forget about it. The resurrection changes everything. A little over a week ago, millions of of Americans were hoping that a $600 million lottery would change their lives, right? I, I, I was, the, the day, the next morning, I was reading the article about $1.5 billion of, of lottery tickets were purchased for that and just how many hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes the government is getting, right, because of that. And but I, 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 was, I liked all the comments that were at the end of the article. You know, you go online, you can write whatever you want to write. <clears throat> and Americans are pretty funny. Because there was a lot of good ones. I'm only going to use a few that I liked, you know. First one I read, good morning, fellow losers. <laughs> Another guy says, looks like I'll still be living in a van down by the river. Those of you who have heard Matt Foley's inspirational speech, you know. Another guy writes, rats, I hope I get into work before my boss on Monday. I like this one, perspective. I didn't win, but I also didn't get stuck in the eye with a sharp stick, so I guess it's, I guess it's a good day, you know. I want to recount. I have the winning ticket, and they drew the wrong numbers. It works for politicians, right? So that's, <laughs> that wasn't me. It was somebody else wrote that. If you're, a, you're a, I love this one because it was creative. I have for sale 10 mega million quick pick lottery tickets, mint condition, almost new. $9 or best offer, right? <laughs> then there was one that wasn't funny, but it caught my, it, it made me think. This person wrote this. If they did a reality show following the winners for a year to see how their lives have changed, I'd watch that. If they did a reality show following the winners for a year to see how their lives have changed, I'd watch that. You know, the thing I love most about the Gospels and the book of Acts they're a reality show. They are a reality show. There were no cameras back then to film them. They are a reality show. They are the honest eyewitness testimony of the followers of Christ. And so I want you to turn back to Mark chapter 1. Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament, and then Mark, Mark chapter 1, and we're not going to be reading initially about Jesus on the cross, or 
or the apostles in the upper room. We read about how this real show, this real life experience unfolds for them. They're honest. They're very honest. It's one of the things that is so authentic about the Gospels. There is no other, nothing like it, all the man-made religions. You have a bunch of guys who, there is no way these are fellows who sat down and said, hey, let's, let's make up a religion. They are too honest with how lousy they were <laughs> at believing in Jesus. And in Mark chapter 1, <clears throat> we come across the, the disciples now, and they're the beginning of this real relationship with Jesus. Mark chapter 1, we read in verse 21, They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. That is, Jesus did. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Jesus didn't need a demon telling people who he was. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority... He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into the surrounding district of Galilee. And so they see Jesus has the power to call a demon out of a man. We go down into verse 32 and we read, When evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases And cast out many demons. And so he has power over demons. He has power over diseases. Uh, One particular, we come to verse 40. And a leper came to Jesus. A horrible disease in their time. Because not only was it a horrible way to die. But it was a social outcast. People thought it was absolutely contagious. And so you you lost everything. And so... This, this man we read about there, the leper came to him in verse 40, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Wow. We get into Mark chapter 2 and friends, they, they, they're, 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 their friend is, is, is paralyzed and they want to get him to Jesus and so they climb on top of this house because they can't get in. There's too many crowds and they, it, it isn't like our houses where they dug up, they, they tore a hole in their ceiling. The houses where you could move the ceiling kind of part and they pulled apart some of it and they lowered the man. Jesus says to the man, your sins are forgiven and the the, the priests and the religious leaders are saying, what? He can't say that sins are forgiven. And Jesus says, what's easier, to say his sins are forgiven or to tell him to get up and walk? He's been crippled his whole life. So I say to you in, the name, in, my, in my name, get up and walk. And he walks. And, and they see all of this. Power over demons, power over diseases, power over leprosy, power over all sorts of physical ailments. And the point is this, while they are listening to his teaching, the disciples' confidence is not being built on his teaching. Their confidence is being built on his presence. Look what he can do. Now we hear them saying they're amazed at his teaching, but what's going to be clear, and they're going to be honest about, is his teaching didn't carry them very far. His presence did. He was there with them, and they knew what he could do. I was remembering, oh, now 22 years ago or so, uh, when, when my son, I don't know, he was two, three, but we, he, he, we, I had, we had got him a big wheel, you know, a, you know and, and uh, those little bikes, you know, the two wheels in the back and the one in the front, you know, that he was going to ride around and I put it together only because they weren't very hard to put together. You put the wheels on and, you know, uh, and, 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 
and, and I was sitting on our steps where we lived in Kingsway Village over in Cherry Hill, and, and we had just a little, you know, sidewalk stretch in front of us. And over here by that property, there were some hedges. And over here, there was, there, was a, there was a fence and hedges as well. And so I said to him, you can ride back and forth. That's fine. You can ride back and forth. But only as you go back and forth, don't go beyond where I can see you. So if you ride over here, that's fine. But make sure you can see me. And if you ride over there, that's fine. But you still got to make sure you can see me. And so he would do that. He would go back and forth. And he would drive over to the one side. And as he would get right near the edge, I'd see his bike stop and he'd, Look back at me. And then he'd turn around and ride to the other side and maybe went a little further this time and his wheel got, you know, was out of my view. But he looked at me. Right, turn around, back he comes. And I, and, and I remember, he, you know, he comes back this time and he, and he gets, you know, I can still see, you know, half the bike, right? He looks at me. Then when he goes all the way across, this time he goes out of my view. And, and, and all that's there is just maybe the, the very back edge of the big wheel. And I can see it, and I'm looking, and I kind of see him do one of these. You know, <laughs> looking back at me, right? And I, I remember that. I, it's, it's just locked in my mind. I can see his face. I remember the day. You know what? I was, you know, for me as a dad, I was doing what maybe you would do. But I was communicating something to him as well, right? That he was safe as long as he could see me. In a sense, subconsciously, I was communicating to him that his security was in my visual presence. That's what the disciples were. Their security, their confidence was, okay, Jesus is here and we know what he can do. And so now turn to Mark chapter 10. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Remember, they're very honest with us, the disciples. None of them say, yeah, well, you know what, I, I, uh, my gospel's a little different because while the rest of them were struggling, I kind of knew before the rest where this whole thing was going. Uh, Jesus and I had a little bit closer relationship. I, I had a, just a deeper faith and I thank God for it. No, nothing like that. <laughs> they're all honest. And they make it very clear to us. If he was in the boat with us, we felt very different than if he was not in the boat with us. It was his visual presence. And so in Mark chapter 10, he's with them, but he gives them more of his message. And, and he's evidently said this before because we read the word again in here. But in Mark chapter 10 and verse 32, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what he was going to happen to him. Saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him and three days later, he will rise again. There it is. And the, and the response is fascinating the way Mark puts it. Right after that, he has James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. You know, when you, when you beat the Romans and everything, we want to be... We're, we're, it's as if we, we see what he just said... You know, maybe you've had this with your kids sometimes, and you're like, okay, listen, you know, here, here's, here, listen, I want you to clean up all your clothes in there, I want you to get outside and do this, I want you to do that, I want you to do this, get your homework done, get that work done, and all right, are we going to McDonald's later? Are we, are we going to Burger King? <laughs> did you hear what I said, right? Are you, you know, there, what, what, did you just miss it? And, and it's almost like that. Jesus says to them, I'm going to go be crucified, and I'm going to rise again from the dead. Yeah, whatever. Whatever, here's, we got a few things on our mind. That's really the way that they respond. You're here in front of us, that's all that matters. You turn to Mark chapter 14, because now they're in the upper room, and, and the hour is late, and they don't realize it, and, and, and Jesus is sharing what we know as, of, as communion, the Lord's Supper with them, and as they're about to receive this and share this, Jesus 
during that time does what? He shares the words with him again, with them again. For in Mark chapter 14 and verse 27, we read this. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. See what he says again? Stick with me here. After I have been raised. And the response? Nobody says anything, right? There's no, what would we, you know, if somebody said, we might be like, whoa, all right, Woo, did you hear that? High five. Okay, we see what's going on. He's told us what's going to happen. And it all ends up with him being raised from the dead. But there's nothing. As a matter of fact, Jesus goes to the garden. And he's in Gethsemane. And he's in agony. And he's in, he's in prayer. And, he, and, and they're sleeping. Nobody's excited. Nobody's ready. They're sleeping. What happens? We read in verse 41 of Mark chapter 14. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is is at hand. And there's probably an apostrophe there, an exclamation point there at at, at the end of your um, translation. At least there should be. Because it's Jesus saying, wake up, get up, come on, let's go, come on, wake up, let's go. It's time, it's time. You ever have that where you're woken up from something and you're, okay, let me get my, get my, get my, get my composure, collect my thoughts here, get, get my bearings. When I was in college, uh, at Philadelphia College of Bible, uh, my freshman year, I had... Uh, one of my roommates, Randy Smith, he, he was from here and he uh, went, to, went, went to Baptist High with me and we'd be, we were roommates at PCB, Philadelphia College of Bible then, PBU now. And, um, and we shared a bedroom with two other guys. One of them, his name was Bruce Lee. <laughs> and he didn't look anything like Bruce Lee, but he was like Bruce Lee. I mean, Bruce Lee was very... And what my, my roommate, Bruce Lee, was very, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, very, very quiet, but he could kick the ceiling of our dorm room. He, we, we, one night he's showing us, and, and uh, I, we tried it, and it didn't work out too well, you know. But, like, but he's he kicking the ceiling. He was showing us very humbly. We're like, break this, break this. And he's, you know, just, you know. He was great at martial arts. I also had a roommate named Jim Sikowski. Uh, my brother Dan was, was in our room as well, but he shared, uh, he was in the other bedroom with the RA. And Jim Sikowski could, free weights, he would work out behind our dorm room. Bench press 350 pounds with the free weight. And j- he just was. <sighs> Dave Fox was across the hall. And Dave was a security guard, and he always got the, the night shift. And we were irritating him like college guys and waking him up during the evening, you know, like, you know, while he's trying to sleep because he's got to get up and work from midnight to 8 a.m. or whatever. And, and he's, come on, I got to sleep. And he decided he would get us back. And Dave was doing rounds at 3 or 4 in the morning. And our dorm room was ground level. And Dave decided... I'm going to give them a little wake-up call and took his security flashlight, uh, which is the only weapon he had to guard 120 acres of property, which <laughs> why I was not a security guard, right? And, and, and he, he, he went to knock on the window. The window shattered. <laughs> I just remember laying there in bed that night and hearing this shattering glass and just, okay, wait a minute, okay, hold on a second. I'm in my dorm room. Uh, Bruce can kick the ceiling. Jim can bench press 350. All right. I'm okay, right? (laughs) You know, (laughs) well, uh, you know, I kind of got my bearings. My point is, none of that happens here, right? No apostle gets up and says, what's that? What's that? Okay, everybody. Oh, that's right. Wait a minute. It's happening. He told us he's going to rise from the dead. Okay. All right. Here we go. None of that. They just 
panic. Matter of fact, we get to verse 50. And what do we read in verse 50 of Mark chapter 14? In verse 50 we read, And they all left him and fled. Sometimes we'll be watching a movie at our house. And, um, you know, it's one of those movies that, you know, I can't, I, you, know, some, you know, you may like them. I, you know, they just get to me, that scene where, like, you know, we know that this person, you can't trust them, but she doesn't. And, you know, she's getting in the car with this guy who supposedly was her husband's best friend, but he had her husband murdered. And, you're, and, and I'm just going, oh, come on. Oh. And my son Vince, or one of my daughters, whatever, may say, you know, Dad, this is why we don't like watching movies with you. Come on. You're ruining it, all right? You, Dad, stop. Just, you know, you got to, you know that she's going to be okay in the end. Nobody. Nobody gathers them around. No Peter, you know, the rock saying, okay, everybody, hang on. This is the part that, 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 that makes us uncomfortable, but we know how it's going to end. The point is this. The message that Jesus would rise from the dead did not change them at all. And they're honest with that. All of the disciples are honest with the fact, though he told us over and over again that he would rise from the dead, we have to be honest, it didn't affect us one bit. It did not change us at all. It's a reality show they're giving us a clue on. Matter of fact, it's even more than that. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. For this is Easter Sunday morning. Luke chapter 24. And in Luke chapter 24, we read, Verse 1, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices and, which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Exciting things here. The tomb's empty, and there's a, a, some men there that say, why do you seek the, uh, the, the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen, and great stuff. And they go to the apostles. We read in verse 10, now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. Verse 11, but these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. And we say, ah, oh, that doubting Thomas. Listen, that doubting Peter, that doubting John, that doubting, can you name every one of them? The point is this, the prediction of the resurrection did not change their lives. And now with the empty tomb and the possibility of the resurrection doesn't change their lives. The only thing that was going to change their lives was what? The proof. Proof of the resurrection. You can tell I'm going to get excited now because John chapter 20. John chapter 20. The point I've been trying to make with all of this is to see. Let's look at the reality show. Did the resurrection change their lives? Well, the message of it didn't. The possibility of it didn't. But in John chapter 20, we read in verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. He's standing there in front of them with scarred hands and feet and a side. And now 
they are ready to be changed by the resurrection. See, these aren't some super high sensitive spiritual guys that were on a whole nother level. And they, these were guys like me. But now they are ready to be changed by the resurrection. For there he stands, having defeated death, alive again. And Acts continues the story and turn to Acts chapter 1. Because in Acts chapter 1, we read there in verse, in, in, uh, well, we'll read there in, in verse 3, as Jesus, before he ascends, we read in Acts 1 and verse 3, to these, that is to his followers, his, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. They were convinced. Now they are absolutely convinced that Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of man. He was buried. He has risen again. He's alive. And being convinced changes their need of his visible presence. Because look what happens in verse 11 uh, or, or in verse 9. And after he had said these things of Acts 1, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He's gone. They don't see him anymore. But that's okay now. And if you look, one last passage of Scripture there in Acts chapter 4. For they go from that place proclaiming the message that Jesus Christ who was crucified for all to see has been risen again. They are eyewitnesses. They know it. They've seen it. It's proven. It's absolute. They go forward in the name of Jesus. They heal a man. And the religious leaders who orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus, the very same religious leaders who were involved in his trial and putting him on the cross, they now arrest these men, put them in jail, Bring them on trial and say, we remember how scared you were of us. We saw you all run that night when we took them away from you. We put them on the cross. We killed them. You were all hiding. It's us. That's right. The powerful, the mean, the scary. And we're telling you, don't you say another word in his name. And in Acts chapter 4 and in verse 9, Peter says... If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And they say, don't you understand what we're saying to you guys? We're the ones who killed Jesus. We're the ones who made you run. We're going to do the same thing to you. In verse 19, Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Don't, uh, 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 excuse me, excuse me, authorities. We're not the same guys that you saw back there. We have become convinced of the resurrection. And when they were convinced of the resurrection of Jesus, they didn't need his visual presence anymore to know that he was still with them wherever they went. When they became convinced of the resurrection of Jesus, they knew this relationship they had with him was like no other relationship that would ever be. This relationship was everlasting life. Nothing could ever stop it, not even death. When you're convinced of the resurrection, you enter into a relationship that's like no other.
Back in 1974, there was a tree at Strawbridge Lake in Morristown. And that tree had some initials in it. VM and JW TLA. The VM was Vince McDonald. I didn't become a Jehovah's Witness. It was Vince McDonald. The JW stood for a girl named Jill Whalen. And of course, she put TLA in. True love always. <laughs> I remember when I met Jill Whalen. I, 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 it, it was, she, she was a new student to our school in, in seventh grade. It was late summer of 1973. I think, I, I think I'm remembering it accurately. As she came down the hallway, she was walking in slow motion. <laughs> Little breeze was blowing. She was the closest thing I had ever seen to Lori from the Partridge family at that time, right? If you, and I remember as I saw her, I just... I, I, I could hear in my ears, there was a group called Bread at the time, and I hear, heard the song, Baby, I'm a want you. Baby, I'm a need you. Some of you with seventh graders are saying, I'm so glad you are not like he was. What? My goodness gracious, you know, what a kook. At the end of seventh grade, the summer of 74, we, a couple of us from our class went on a picnic to to Strawbridge Lake, and there we etch those initials in the tree. I have no idea if the tree is still there. I know that by the beginning of 75, the love was gone. It was over the, you know. <laughs> I contrast that relationship with the fact that as that relationship was ending, I was about to enter into a new one, like no other I've ever known. For the God of all creation in His grace and in His goodness opened the eyes of this teenage boy to the truth that His Son Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on the cross as a payment for my sin and rose again from the dead. And I remember Easter in the spring of 1975 and I remember Hearing the verses of Scripture when Jesus said to Thomas, You've seen my wounds and you believe, but blessed are they who have not seen me and yet believe. And as a young teenager, I remember thinking, That's me! And for 37 years, every day of my life has been affected by the fact that I am convinced that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I have not lived perfectly every day. I have not lived boldly every day, but I can tell you this. Every day, every fear, every trial, every difficulty, every moment, everything I have faced for 37 years, I have faced convinced that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. And someday, when my life is about to end, Jesus, the living Christ, will be with me as He is every other moment. Are you convinced? Amen. Are you living that way? Amen. Are you convinced that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Has it changed your life? Let's bow. I don't know if it's changed your life, and I praise God for all of you who it has. But you may be, I'm talking to you in a special way this morning as we close. Maybe you're here today, and you're, you literally would say, I never even heard that before. Somebody invited me here today, but I never heard that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Maybe you're here today, and you're saying... I've heard it before, I, I grew up going to school or learning about it, but I never, all of a sudden right now, my heart is beating faster. It's just, it's just I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. I want you to know, the God of all creation loves you. He loves you because He chose to, not because you're lovable. 
He loves you because He wanted to. And our sin separates us from heaven. It leaves us at death, cast away from God. But God loved us so much and He loved you so much that Jesus died on the cross to pay for every sin of yours and mine. He paid the price for all of it. Shed His blood. He rose again from the dead in victory for you, for me. And in this quiet moment right now, if you will say, Oh God Almighty, I want to know. I want to be changed by the resurrection. I want to know that when I die, I will live with you forever. Oh God, I want to be your child. I want to know that you are living in me and will be with me in everything I face. Oh God, forgive me of my sin. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Won't you pray that right now? In your own heart to God? That's what it's all about. He wants to change your life forever. Maybe you're here today and as we're about to close in prayer, you prayed that prayer. Maybe you said, Lord God, forgive me of my sin, save me, change me. If you prayed that prayer, we have our heads bowed, our eyes closed. And yet I, I want to look up myself and I want to ask you, just so that I might rejoice in God, if you prayed that prayer could you just let me know that by very quickly, just lift up your hand and put it down. Lift it up, put it down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, God. You see our hearts. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for changing us. Thank you for defeating death. The greatest enemy we had for giving us forgiveness of sins in life forever. In Jesus' name, amen.